not expecting that. <laughs> what an intro. My kind of chaos that I like to bring into things is a little bit different than Hash's kind of chaos. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> but, you know, here we are and that's what's important. We've started. Um, so, today... Uh, we have a few things we want to talk about. Uh, the first one actually comes from a little bit of a a personal experience that I have ex- had recently uh, with a friend of mine who got their wisdom teeth out. Uh, this was... Wisdom teeth is like... It's a wild thing to begin with. You're like getting your teeth pulled, but it's like such a, a trivial thing that you do that like there's just like little clinics that look like someone just like started them for fun and you go there and they're like, yeah, we'll like, you know hook you up to this machine and it looks like they probably it's probably their only machine that they own and it's 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 weird it feels very janky and not secure um but then they're like yeah and we yank your teeth out and now you're bleeding so go home <laughs> and, and it's just it's not it's not a great experience um just all around but it did get me thinking about something um in medicine specifically because we're sitting there and were uh they're getting everything ready hooking uh, my friend up to all their machines and stuff for anesthetic and all the you know things and then they come in with their clipboard like they do and they're like here's all this paperwork you know we need you to sign here this is the consent form for the anesthetic and for the procedure and here's your information about what to do afterwards and they go through all this paperwork and there's this this there was this really weird feeling that I got sitting there I was like, this feels normal. Like being in a medical office, getting paperwork, signing paperwork. This feels very normal. But then it also feels a little weird that like there's this consent thing going on. But all that's happening is they're like, here's a piece of paper. You're expected to sign your name on the bottom of this paper. And this means you consent to what is about to happen. But not only that, it's like anesthetic that we're talking about. So it's something that like if it goes wrong, can go terribly wrong. Um, And and you realize very quickly that like what this is saying is I no longer have responsibility for what happens if something happens. That that's something that the insurance agencies will just battle out. Um, And that's a really it's a weird thing that it it, to, to do to a person to just like have them recognize that we are trivializing the potential negative and life-altering effects that come out of a, a, a procedure. I don't know if you have any initial thoughts on this, but my first reaction to this is to think, well, why, why are we doing this? <laughs> and why do we feel the need to do this? Does that make sense? Yes, it definitely makes sense. So, you know, I, I let's just throw out a for talking point. Mm-hmm. Um, well, maybe it's just for legal reasons. This is just yeah. a reactionary thing that uh, because of the way the legal system has built up around it, that's why. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's probably 100% um, correct. And you see this all over the place. Uh, I was talking with another one of my friends about another type of consent uh, uh, issue. They were uh, going through the consent training or, or whatever you want to call it for a university and noticing that it was just awful, like it usually is, like just really low quality stuff where no one knows what they're doing. Um, and it just seems like very much a formality. Uh, and then you realize that, oh, this exists because it's harder to prosecute students that mess up if we haven't educated them on or informed them of their obligations while on campus. And so, you know, having you go through this training is another way of just like making sure that we can prosecute you if something goes wrong. But two things to note there. Number one is it's weird that it's normal. Like we expect this to be how just things go. Like it seems completely natural for you to just be like literally signing your life away potentially um, in a doctor's office without even thinking. Um, and then it's it's like normal to go through a consent training and and it's and and just you know click through the videos as fast as you can. <laughs> it's normal to do that and it feels normal, but then also it is notoriously like low quality. Like it's a joke. 
Like, it really is a joke. Like, you do consent training, and then you go tell your friends about how stupid consent training is. That's, like, a cultural thing now. Uh, and then you, like, you sign your life away, and you, like, joke to the nurse that you're signing your life away. It's, like, trivialized, and yet we're using this... It, it, it exists so that we can, like, I don't know, navigate really real things in real systems. That's why it exists. It's supposed to hold weight. That's why we're doing this. And yet, it's it doesn't feel like it holds weight. I don't know. Do you why. think functionally it could? Is it even possible for it to ever hold weight? And that, I don't. I Like, sitting there, I was like, I think that you could try to convince me that I was signing my life away here and you could try and convince a judge mm -hmm. that that's what was going on here mm -hmm. um but I think if you were to actually sit down and talk to me about what was going on there's no way you could convince me I actually had meaningfully signed my life away and I think that holds up in reality too am I just not going to sue you if my friend dies on your you know janky little table in this wisdom teeth only office yeah <laughs> No, I'm going to sue you because, like, I do see, like, this is a, I, I don't, I don't actually uh, personally treat this as an actual consent going on in any meaningful way. Yeah, I have two interesting things here. One is, you know, how it inter intersects with our conversation about free will last time. Um, if we take seriously the notion that we maybe don't have any kind of fundamental free will, then doesn't that lead us to a real problem with consent? <laughs> what does consent mean, right? Yeah. Um, if uh, consent was boiled down to the idea of just there is something that you can agree to and you choose to agree to it, that that's as simple as the calculation is, then if you had free will, that would make a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And it'd be great. <laughs> because you could just take responsible for, uh, responsibility for something, even if it wasn't informed. Mm -hmm. Does this make sense? You could literally just be like, I made that choice. I'm responsible now. Yeah, exactly. But if there's some way in which you are forced to make this choice... Mm -hmm. Um, then it, it just changes the calculation completely. And I think there are two ways of looking at this. One is the idea of maybe you're not metaphysically free, um, meaning it doesn't even matter what si like what uh, <laughs> situation you're in, social machine you're in. You're ignore determined. all of that. You're just you're just completely determined. So then, what the fuck does, does <laughs> just cause consent mean in the first place? Well, maybe it's a way to access our our uh, rational part of our brains, and yeah. basically, it's a way of socially engineering everyone to depend more upon the rational action. Mm -hmm. That makes a certain amount of sense, but at the same time. What if we just look at the social machines themselves? Like, are we free then? <laughs> Can you go anywhere uh, yeah. to get your wisdom teeth taken out where you don't have to sign your life away? Mm -hmm. Is that is that even an option? Yeah, and I think it also would be interesting to point out that the definition of coercion here <laughs> has to is usually uh, paired with some like imminent uh, cause of, of discomfort or harm that someone imposes on you in unless you make a certain decision. Mm -hmm. So coercion is saying, you know, you you could choose either way, but I there are, I will force consequences on you unless you do exactly what I say. It's a way of manipulating people with consequences. Um, and if you take that to be just kind of how we see coercion, then wisdom teeth is not a place where there is no co coercion going on because usually people are getting these out because there are bad consequences for not doing it. And in, in the case of my friend, it was because it was actively causing them pain to have the teeth in their mouth, which means there was an incredible pressure to get it done and get it done timely. And that required them to be signing their life away on a document. <laughs> yeah. Um, and fun the funny thing is, it's not even functionally how it works. If you sign away your life and then a doctor screws up, the doctor can still be prosecuted. Yeah. Even though you signed your life away, because we kind of realize this problem at a societal exactly. level. Exactly. And so 
if 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 someone can be convinced that the situation uh was a coerced situation for instance then yeah it, the the basically the contract is just voided like yes it doesn't even matter that that you did that so so this is this is the wild thing is like i'm thinking about how we could potentially use this document why does this piece of paper exist and where will it go <laughs> as they're, they're like <laughs> handing it to us you know and and i'm thinking okay so eventually maybe let's say something goes wrong let's say the anesthetic goes terribly wrong um and that has brain damage consequences because someone was out for longer than they should be um very real scenario unlikely but real now if we go to court what is the first thing we do before this document becomes useful we try and justify that this 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 situation was one in which they were aware and consented to what was going to happen and that everyone followed the rules essentially you try and show that things are fine <laughs> and then you're like now this document makes sense. <laughs> this document is my proof. And how do we trust this document? Because I explained the situation that the document arose in. So you could get rid of the document and then you would, you'd be in exactly the same situation where you could describe what happened um, and, and whether or not they seemed informed and it w or, or whether or not it was coercion and whether or not things went right. Um, and then you could just skip the whole document stage and it would be virtually the same. So if that's the case, if we're dealing with a situation that um, is unnecessarily complicated, mm -hmm. um, here's maybe a hot take about why we still retain that complication. What if it's a way to force people to become part of the established institution? Yes, and I'm glad you took it there because this is, this is while well, I'm sitting there in the like half hour while this is the procedure is going on, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking wow, we have a system here that I was just initiated into. <laughs> like, that's what just happened. <laughs> like, <laughs> we don't understand anesthetic. We don't understand what's going to happen. They explain very little besides the fact that my teeth or their teeth are going to be gone in a half an hour. Um, and then it's like they go to sleep and I leave <laughs> and the whole system just does its thing. But now we're a part of it because we did this, like, entrance ritual which is weird but then this is where it gets more problematic though because maybe it is just like a like we are going to formalize the fact that you're a part of this 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 system um as as a way of kind of like greasing the gears maybe you know because you weren't initially part of this system but now we want you to be in order to do this procedure yeah. so we're going to do that now where it gets problematic is that later uh, after the whole procedure, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of, of bleeding and we were getting concerned about how much bleeding there was. And so we call them back and we explain the situation. We say, look, it's been bleeding a lot, you know, and we don't know if this is OK. Um, we want to make sure, you know, that nothing goes wrong here, you know, and you are the part of the system that we interact with <laughs> in order to get information on what to do. Um, and they asked us to explain the situation a bit further and asked whether or not the bleeding had slowed down at all. And I mentioned just very briefly that it was slightly less than when they did the operation right after the operation, but it was still bleeding a lot. And then they like latched on to that phrase and started saying like, oh, okay, so it sounds like it's getting better, which is not what I said. And then every time I was like, no, we need to do something like it sounds like it's getting better. So, you know, don't worry about it. Just wait until it stops bleeding. And they really just started like brushing us off, which first off, very stressful, <laughs> didn't make my day any better. <laughs> um, and like, it's not what you want to feel when you're interacting with the system is that you're being forgotten in the system and not listened to in the system. But it made me realize something, which was the the uh, the downside to doing this entrance ritual where you just like conform to this system is that if everyone is just conforming to this system in this system, then there are no more like real interactions going on because I'm sure that this person, I like thinking about it, were doing exactly the same thing I was doing where they are legally and through paper signed on to the system as the receptionist for a dentist office. Yes. And so when they get a call, they're, they're, uh, the incentive for them is to just 
dismiss the problem as quickly as possible because that's what their job is as a receptionist. Like they're supposed to just resolve things, which means that like in order to be a part of the system, we have left something behind, which is the actual like people, if that makes sense. That's a bit of like a, I don't know, there's a lot going on in that kind of breakdown. This is just my initial thoughts, but I don't know. That's what I started thinking about. Yeah. I wonder if, I mean, there's kind of a praxis that's mm -hmm. built into this. Like, are you trying to suggest, and I know this isn't fully formed, <laughs> but uh, which road are we going to go down? Is it that there's something wrong with the system and that means that we can present a system that works better? Does it mean that there's, as your friend thinks, there's something wrong with the system and that's just a, the nature of systems themselves yeah. and that we're only ever going to be free of those problems when we're free of systems? <laughs> Get rid of them. <laughs> um, or, or something else. Like, what? Yes. I, I wonder where this points us. So there's a whole discussion of systems here because paperwork is ubiquitous <laughs> um, and systems are ubiquitous right now. And there are a lot of people who as we pointed out, uh, dislike this fact. But I don't actually think we need to have the bigger discussion. I don't know if, if we're even equipped to have it um, in this setting. But what we can do is talk about medical systems specifically. Because I do think there's something really fascinating going on in medical systems where there is this power imbalance, this coercion, we might call it in a lot of situations. And even when there isn't coercion, there's this strong hierarchical reality where you are at the bottom because you don't know what's going on and you're the one that needs help and the other people are at the top where they know what's going on and they're the only ones that can fix things and i think that that you you start to realize becomes the reason we have this system of formalities which is that like you're interacting with things you don't understand. You can't actually consent to some of these things because you don't actually have the ability to be informed. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm wondering, I don't know, that's, that's kind of the direction I wanted to take it in. So it's kind of a, an epistemic barrier that mm -hmm. there's a certain level that you have to reach to be able to be a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And thus, it is just fundamentally not available, inaccessible to the layman. Mm -hmm. And we have to have this kind of a divide. And because of that, we've just kind of reified the divide through a system that allows for uh, accreditation for the mm -hmm. practitioner and protection on both sides. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. And but but this is this is the interesting thing is that the place in which these two people intersect is this formality that we do paperwork or, or consent training videos, if it's in some other uh, field, but in the medical field, it's this, this paperwork and like standards for operating. But what's, what's, what's interesting there is that these are all uh, like dehumanized things. There's no human characteristic to it. You become, a number in their system and and you can see this most obviously when it comes to like navigating issues that arise because of the difference in power which no when something goes wrong in a surgery that is the product of a difference in power you were expecting something out of a surgery you wanted something out of a surgery and they operated on you and caused a problem frequently um because of this this position that we put them in and maybe it was an honest mistake. Maybe it wasn't. Is it kind of besides the point here? The point is, is that they did inflict something on you, um, and and the way we navigate those is through insurance, which is notoriously like, well, if it fits a definition, then we can give you a dollar amount. You know, hope it turns out for either of you. But there's no there's no consideration between persons there. It's this really strong buffer. I like this idea of abstraction, of, of dehumanization. 
um, we probably don't talk about it enough in the way that it works because of the system. So let me mm -hmm. give an example. Um, we lined up already how we get the particular medical system that we do, mm -hmm. which is that there's a, there are requirements and there are needs, and we need a way of, um, of policing both of those so that those who say that they have particular abilities and knowledge medically really do have it to yes. some degree. We can create a system of trust. Um, but Hash's point, I like this quite a bit, is that the moment that you then take the system to be more real than the circumstances which brought about the system, mm -hmm. you get into a weird idea of how things work. So um, a, a good way of explaining this might be the development of a small community. So when you first have this small community, it is made up of not a number of people. You don't, the, the community doesn't view themselves as being a community of 5,000 random individuals. Instead, they view themselves as a collection of these particular individuals. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that everyone knows everyone. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no sense of abstraction here. There's, it's just the people, and that makes up the community. And thus, when they are doing the testing, when they're you know trying to figure out who they can trust, it's a it's a very one to one system. And although there may be a kind of formalization in the beginning, it's much smaller, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as that formalization increases, mm -hmm. you suddenly put more and more trust in the system itself and less and less in the people in the people that actually brought about the development of the system. Until nowadays, you have a giant hospital that has virtually no idea who its constituents actually are. Yeah. The only thing it prepares for is a statistical likelihood of a certain number of people of a particular kind of statistical like yeah. it's, it's all abstractions right it's yeah completely faceless yeah like completely until you come and then yeah. you become a person in the system yeah <laughs> and and then it's like your identity is swapped for whatever closest fits that in a medical yeah, yeah. textbook like a, a picture <laughs> and your name and your height and your weight yeah. like that's who you are exactly and for all intents and purposes it doesn't matter what you will say to them about certain other things like if you don't quite fit their picture they'll just go with their picture and that's a consistent problem in the medical community i think we have several uh, friends who have expressed this very concern which is that they are somewhat of of exceptional cases in, in regards to like averages in society um and it means that whenever they interact with the medical system at all the medical system refuses to see them even for what they're saying they are and instead tells them that they're something that they are quite clear. And many other doctors that they've worked with have become like aware of this as well, that they aren't that thing, but that every time they interact with the medical community, they, they start from this ground zero of, ah, let's start with the picture that is closest, which isn't accurate at all. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting that that's, that's not just a fluke. Yeah. It seems to be baked into how we're doing this. Yeah, that's really weird. And um, and I think this I know you didn't want to get too big into the rest of the picture. Oh, we can go ahead. I just thought that the entry point would be a good easiest yes. <laughs> where the power dynamic is clearest. So No, I appreciate that. And I think um this is just making me think about how we have gained such a level of trust in our institutions, in government institutions, in our community institutions, that um, we, in kind of a large social way, have started to think of ourselves in these non-human abstract ways. Like when I think about my town, Orem, I take it as, as a, a matter of happenstance that I happen to live with the people that I do mm -hmm. and that I'm not, I don't actively think of like everybody in my community as an individual who lives in my community. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's kind of like, I, I'm just thinking in terms of these numbers. Yeah. Like the, my country has 
this many million people in mm -hmm. it is, produces this much product and yeah stuff like that. yeah it's all it's all in terms of this statistical like removed step removed from the society mm -hmm. where i i just have like basic assumptions about the statistical likelihood of meeting a particular kind of person in a particular kind of place mm -hmm. or um there's just so much reliance on stereotypes yes and and I, I'm not necessarily trying to suggest that all of this is evil and bad, um, but it's it does present issues. Yeah, very big issues, especially and, and like you can navigate these issues in most situations. I feel like so like for example, yes, there's this crazy systemization going on when it comes to like how we d controlled the groceries in the country. <laughs> it's this huge scale thing. But because there isn't as much of like a, and, and this isn't true in every case, but for a lot of people, this is not an issue because they have the certain financial mobility that makes it so that they don't run into the, the unfortunate edges of this, of being not treated like a human in this system. That they are secure enough in other ways that this system dehumanizing them, which it literally does, like when was the last time you interacted with a cashier? Um... <laughs> dehumanizing you in this system doesn't actually have the negative effects that we would that can happen for most people but it it can it can have the problems where like there are plenty of places that are really really uh, underserved by the system and hurt by the fact that it is a dehumanizing system so another way of looking at this is kind of from the calculation that an ethics of care makes so the argument the basic argument that an ethics of care is trying to get across is that there's a problem when you have a big system that's generally and principally concerned with the welfare of the majority. Because this makes sense in a lot of ways, except for the fact that it's guaranteed to fail the minority. Yeah. It's not just that it does fail to minority. It's baked into it that if you are trying to serve statistical likelihood, mm -hmm. then whatever is not statistically likely is by definition not taken into account. It's being selected out of, of the system. Yes. So whoever happens to not have the system work for them is literally just screwed by the system. Yeah. And, and like, uh, I, I want to say this one more time to try and get across why the, why the ethics of care calculation says that this is so meaningful. Because um, it's like, imagine designing a game where um, you're told that all you have to do is roll a couple of dice. And uh, if you roll anything but a 2 or a 12 then you're, you're good. You win the game, okay? Seems like a good game, right? Um, wins most of the time. <laughs> wins most of the time. The problem is that half a million people play this game, and if you were to actually look at them one by one, it would be, it, and it is, disturbing to see how many people just straight up lose and their voice just completely disappears mm -hmm. because there's just an overwhelming um, majority of other people saying, look, this is so great for me. Yeah. Um, and those people get lit, like their humanity is literally removed because it's like basically you're the sacrifice yeah, that is for necessary the majority. for the majority to thrive. A great example of this that I think everyone will relate with uh, because we all hate it. This is interesting because it serves the majority, but even the majority hates it. <laughs> um, <laughs> is a credit score. Like mm. for the financial system, you have been reduced to a single digit, which is wild. <laughs> and, and the thing about a credit score is for most people, it's fine because it serves as a metric of their financial stability and it, it, it establishes like trust that is transferable. You can go to a brand new bank and they'll be completely fine loaning you money. And, and for most people, this works fine because their credit score happens to be decent. But what happens if you have a 
bad credit score for any reason. It can be something out of your control. If you have a bad credit score, it becomes harder and harder to get a better credit score to the point that there are people with terrible enough credit scores that they will just never be able to interact with the banking system. And like, I think most of us like are aware of this, but I don't know if we're like as immediately aware of just how awful that situation is and how real it is for so many people. Um, but again, it's like, it's serving the majority. It's allowing us to, to move banks very freely and like do our financial business in a pretty concise way. But it has this, this drawback of taking a certain group of people and being like, sorry, you don't get to exist as a person. So um, the the care approach is the idea that you have to, everyone needs to be taken care of on a small scale because that's the only way that everyone gets their needs, needs met, not mm-hmm. just the majority, yes. but everyone. And it's because relationships are really meaningful to us as humans. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of, a baseline yeah. of how we function. And importantly, relationships are surprisingly efficient at taking care of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, remarkably so. If you focus on the small scale, you just end up getting a lot of small scales that tend to work pretty well, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I think a lot of people... Um, I don't know how much history I want to get into here, but um, there's been this push and pull between these two ideas of serving the majority or even the super majority by trying to do what's best on a huge societal scale versus um, forget the societal scale taking care of on a small scale. This conversation is really, really old. It is the conversation between state and federal rights Mm -hmm. that was occurring um, because they're just two different, it's the idea of what kind of government's going to serve the most people in the best, in the way, best way, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's this tension between the two. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that it, it, it's not just pulling all the way towards the ethics of care, because we've made it sound like ethics of care is great, is that one problem is that if you try to take the system that any particular small community has of taking care of each other, and scale it up, it just doesn't, it doesn't work, work at all. because small communities work on 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 principles that that cannot scale up, like mercy and forgiveness and mm-hmm. and, and compassion, and proximity and proximity. Like these things don't they they can function at a small level, and they do, but they don't function as large at a large level yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah. You don't care about people who are hundreds of miles away from you, and you'll no, only know them by a picture. Mm-hmm. That's just not how we work. And so you're not capable of functioning in a caring relationship with them. Yeah. Uh, but what was it? It's like they have, there's an actual number in, in psychology where they say this is about as many people as you can meaningfully know. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't I know what the number is. it's like 100 or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's really small. It's very small. But that's that's the idea is that like right in, in small scale relationships, you are the unit that we're using to like maintain things. But we can't scale it up more than like, you know, a dozen dozen, you know, like it doesn't, it doesn't grow much bigger than that. So then you get, you, you return to the situation of the medical field and you can see why we have the problem we have and why it's a problem. <laughs> you, we have the problem we have because how many people need their wisdom teeth removed? Pretty much everyone. <laughs> Basically everyone. I haven't gotten mine removed, but I'm, I'm rolling the dice with that, you know, um, <laughs> Basically, everyone needs it, which means it's incredibly advantageous to try and create a systematic way of getting everyone or taking away everyone's wisdom teeth. Um, But that is such a large scale that the only way to do it is to dehumanize it into this piece of paper that you sign and a group of people who are paid a nine to five job who do not care about each other, who will only ever interact with each other this one time and will actually avoid further interactions if they yeah, can. Yeah, there's, a, there's a certain amount of um, purposeful depression of these characteristics like mercy, forgiveness, and compassion, mm-hmm. where they're, they're suppressed because the system requires that a certain number of people are sacrificed for the greater good. Yes. And you can't care about those people because otherwise the system doesn't work. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you have someone who calls you near the end of your shift, who says, my friend here is bleeding more than I think is appropriate, or at least it seems like it's an issue. Um, what is your tendency going to be? Even if it's just subconscious, your tendency is going to be distancing yourself from this problem and making it feel like it's not your problem, that it's not actually a problem at all, and that they should just wait until, well, I'm at home now, I'm no longer on shift. So (laughs) (laughs) delay, 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 delay. Well, and I don't think it's at all fair to uh, villainize anyone in this yeah, because no. that's the whole point is that that's they the job they it. were hired to do. Yeah, <laughs> the, the thing that's doing this is the system. And I think this is actually a really good argument for why people should treat systems as real entities <laughs> um, because some people push back against that. Uh, it's, it's not all these people are just people who signed their lives into this. They've all gone through this initiation that is paperwork that doesn't mean anything. And then they have this meaningless relationship that does actually get some things done, but does not care for people. Yeah. I I had a lot of thoughts come in there. Um, I'll just throw out a couple. If you'd like to know more about the conversation between systems being... um, agents entities or not Mm -hmm. you know i would suggest and this is something i doubt many people have ever read before but there's a guy named manuel velasquez Mm -hmm. he's one of these pioneers in business ethics guys um and he's done like his whole career has been trying to convince people that businesses are not moral entities that you can't hold businesses morally accountable and the reason why is because they cannot um, enter into relationships mm. they cannot um, uh, come to agreements or compromises or any of the other fundamental beginnings of moral conversations yeah 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 um, and I find this really interesting because I understand your feelings mm-hmm. I understand how <laughs> there's a way in which um, we can point to the system or any particular system in a way that, is not the same as pointing to any particular group of individuals yeah. who happen to be in a system. They aren't like the individuals aren't individuals aren't like collectively culpable mm-hmm. in the same way that yeah. you're trying to say the system as is culpable. Fascinating as this is, you can take everyone out of Orem. And it feels like Orem's still there. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> There's an emergent property that we're trying to talk about. Oh, here, yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, And yet, I think um, Velasquez has a good point in trying to problematize what you do about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because I think he's 1,000% correct that you can't just straight up morally prosecute something. You're not going to be able to negotiate with Amazon as an entity. (laughs) Exactly. It's not going to happen. You might negotiate and bribe the CEO, but like... You're not going to be able to interact with it as a system. And it's a very robust system at this point, which means that like being able to affect it is an important thing that we need to be able to do as a society because it has so much power. Um, but you're not going to do that just being like, OK, Amazon, show up and let's you know build a relationship between you and me. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. 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 Now, I would also like to just take a little little stab maybe this is unfair of me but i think it's earned um a little stab at the u.s healthcare system here specifically because i would like to point out that there are we've pointed out that there are problems with huge systems and there are problems with uh well there's you can't scale up small systems um and that puts us in this weird dilemma where we have to when we have large scale problems which are like healthcare. <laughs> Um, it becomes difficult to manage that. And I would like to point out that in the United States, we have the worst of both worlds. <laughs> See, because like like right now, it's you buy your own health care in the United yes. States. Now, what is the argument for this? If you ask anyone who supports it, they'll tell you it's so that they can shop around, that they can find the doctors they want, that they can find the care that they want. They're arguing that they can build a relationship system for their own health care. But simultaneously, the only avenue that they have for doing this is through insurance companies, which are the largest scale systems 
we've ever created, period. And the most dehumanized systems we've ever created. And the strongest systems that exist for destroying human relationships. So we, we doubt. Like, like, full stop. And I don't even think they disagree with this. If you talk to someone who supports the, the U.S. healthcare, at least, idea, they will still be entirely against the, the, the insurance system that we have. Because it's awful. Um, so, yeah, there's just... U.S. needs to fix that. <laughs> yeah, and maybe the argument for the current system is fundamentally flawed. I think I would I'd be on board with just saying that straight up. Yeah, because it's fascinating. I mean, we have issues with capitalism that are very deeply rooted. <laughs> um, but there is something to be said about this, like, dream that maybe if we just let people buy their own doctors, they would build stronger relationships and smaller systems. Yeah. Yeah. That's like a, a very legitimate dream, <laughs> I would say. Um, it's fascinating, though, because the system that capitalism has given us in the in the need to scale things up and make them more economically viable and efficient, which is the argument for insurance, um, we have lost even our ability to buy relationships like we like some people wanted us to. Yeah. OK. Um, one other thing I want to touch on is uh, this idea of cities. Um it's interesting growing up in an area that I was in a city, but I was in a suburb. And so it didn't feel like I was in a city, right? I knew who my neighbors were. We all knew each other. Um, we had relationships and we, uh, there was a certain way in which we took care of each other. I, mm -hmm. um, I can name any of my close neighbors all of, every single one of them aided my family in a particular way at a particular time and i remember these instances um, one of the most notable is that uh, having 10 siblings my <laughs> mother was pregnant a lot <laughs> if you're curious that's about eight years of pregnancy <laughs> this is something that we haven't seen with our yes. families <laughs> yes <laughs> and uh as you can imagine, that led to um, our neighbors making us a lot of food. There were just a lot of nights that they would bring over food for us. Yeah. Now I want to point out that um, this um, small scale system, which is explicitly working all along the lines of an ethics of care, mm -hmm. um, it, it worked really well. And for me, growing up, I have always thought on larger scales. And so I became more and more aware of how many people existed in the world and more and more aware of how many people needed caring for. Mm -hmm. And in a certain sense, I started to resent this idea of um, the way that my community was so community focused. Oh, that's fascinating. The way that my community seemed to just blatantly ignore everyone. The rest who, of the world. Who didn't happen to be in the community. Yeah. And so I, I want to point out that um, there were ways in which this is true. So one of the reasons I felt this way is because growing up as a queer individual in an extremely conservative environment... I was a casualty of their system because I, I was one of the few things that they just didn't know how to include and care for. And so amongst all the caring that occurred, I still felt like a casualty personally, if that makes sense. Um, and so I, I saw their care, which is, which was such a good thing objectively as as kind of something that failed because and this is the problem with an ethics of care is that because you're just doing things by motivation of in-group out-group bias mm -hmm. you only ever hurt help who's in the in-group yeah the extent of which you can care for is the hundred or so people that you know yeah and and 
there's degrees to which you know them as well and degrees to which you are aware enough to actually care for someone and in your case very few people were aware enough of the realities yes. of your life to actually care for you because i don't actually think that that in caring relationships you can have uh, situations in which they just like vindictively hate you for no reason <laughs> no, no, no 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 i think no, it no. literally was just in fact they expressed they were... love and care to me all yeah. the time i know that Many people, if they listened to this and heard this, well, and I've had this expressed to me, a, a kind of shock that I felt this way, this way, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think it comes from a, a that the breakdown in relationship comes from more of a lack of awareness and a lack of, of uh, I don't even know what you would call it, but they don't. They're not situated well enough to really know what is going on and what they're doing that's being hurtful or and all that. So, like, in that sense, it isn't that they are dehumanizing you in the same way that a system would dehumanize you. And that's what's causing the problem. There's a different disconnect there. Um, it's not that they systematized their care. It's just that the, the community created its own pockets of, of, of or, or blind spots, you know. Yeah. And so I think... This is the principal motivation for so many um, divergent people in society mm -hmm. to become part of something like the Democratic um, Political Caucus, for instance, mm -hmm. is, uh, I don't know why I said caucus party. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to roll with it. So. <laughs> we're talking about that very specific meeting. No, um, <laughs> it's like a lot of people are doing that apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, is because there's a sense in which what socialism offers you is a flattening of the field mm -hmm. where people aren't allowed to be so biased in the care that they offer. The care just gets offered to everyone, Yep. right? Mm -hmm. um, and the critique that's offered by conservative politicians, which is a perfectly valid critique, is that if you take that too far you get the kind of communism or socialism where everything is perfectly abstracted and no one's a real person. Yeah. You're just a number in the gigantic machine. Yeah. They say it will rob you of your motivations yeah. to do great things, you know, and stuff like that. That there's just like, there's no, there's no human element to it. Mm -hmm. Right. Everyone's just a, a member of the state. So, so here's the thing though. What are we saying? <laughs> because we're saying that you can't have a, a, syst a, a large scale system of care. It doesn't work. Um, or at least it has this tendency to just fall apart. Um, and then we also can't just have strong systems that govern us because they create the same issue in another way yep. and just literally like reject minorities. Um, so what is what is the solution here now there's lots of discussion in this area but i think and i don't we haven't explicitly talked about this in the past as much so tell me if i'm misrepresenting you um but my personal thoughts on this are there are certain things that work best in each of these categories correct so for example um caring for the immediate needs of a person like you know dinners and stuff for a family that is going through some repetitive hard times <laughs> um, or, or, or having some, some difficult things they're, they're having to manage um, a lot of chaos there. Uh, that's something that's better handled on a smaller scale because it, 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 it just the nature of it, but there are other things that are better handled handled by larger scaled things. And the point is, is that you can't go either direction. You can't you can't say that like uh, systems are the solution. Therefore, we get rid of the concept of care like they have done in most of the medical community. <laughs> and you can't say that systems are completely evil and never have a place whatsoever, because then you can only have smaller scale uh, communities. Some people support that. But <laughs> um, okay. so the idea is that you want a large scale system in some ways but you want to preserve the types of care that you have within it. Um, so, for example, with your wisdom teeth, <laughs> just to bring this full circle, it is good to have a regular, systematized, 
you know, process for providing everyone with the procedure that is removing uh, wisdom teeth. And why? Because it's something that almost everyone, everyone is to going to need. Yes. And it's something that needs to be done in a very particular way that needs to be trained, needs to be kept. I mean, you keep track of how it things just are going. obviously works better in a system. Yes. This is the type of thing that you, you can't even learn how to do it unless you're going to be a part of a system that's teaching people how to do it. So um, that's obvious. But you also need to find a way to restore <laughs> the, the, the principle of care within the system. So that when I go to my dentist or whoever it is that removes my wisdom teeth, the understanding is not you have signed away your life. I no longer have responsibility for anything that happens here. That's the insurance company's problem. Instead, it's literally I am somewhat responsible uh, or, or even if it's not responsible, I'm responsible to provide care. And, and those can be different things. One has a legal connotation. Yeah. Um, but there are a multitude of ways that you can do that, that you can help people build caring relationships within systems. And that's what we can't just, like, ignore. Because that's what's happening with the wisdom teeth. They're like, everyone needs this. We're going to do it in the most efficient way. And that means just, like, line up at the door, sign your name on the thing, and we'll take out your teeth. That doesn't work because... It literally people who have complications literally get hurt like yeah, yeah. injured <laughs> or at the very least it's not an ideal system um uh, i think one of the things i want to get across as well mm -hmm. i like this basic idea this would also be my answer is the the answer to the federalist problem is that you need both and not because on like some grand scale, both are necessary because of like a tension that exists between the two of them. I don't think, and this is just a personal political thought, but I, I don't think Madison's point on that was very cogent. I, uh, it's not like states and the federal government are really working a, like a power struggle. I don't think that exists as much as he thought that that would be the problem. Instead, I think it has more to do with the way the outcomes come, which is that states, and, and obviously they talk about this as well, but uh, states are the sort of thing that are smaller and thus better equipped to know the needs and desires and relationships mm -hmm. that exist within their own state. And the federal government is not equipped to do that, but is equipped to, to help things to occur in a more fair way mm -hmm. where this in-group bias that states is essentially have mm -hmm. um, that pushes against that. And so that's the tension that exists. It, are, these, are these moral systems and frameworks that we're dealing with yeah. Um, and that the best way to calculate this is not on a case by case uh, uh, basis for people, mm -hmm. but a case by case basis for what is being considered. Yes. Um, and this is this is where this position tends to like interact with with how everyone is talking about things right now, like. Most people, this is a kind of a wild little experiment you can do for yourself. Uh, if I say everyone deserves universal health care, there's, you know, what is it, a 50-50 chance that you'll be against this or something. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, if, I, if I get rid of the universal there and I just say everyone needs health care and I don't make it a political thing, you'll be like, yeah, no, 100%. <laughs> everyone should be ha have access to health care. And the question then becomes... At what level are we doing this? Is this a you get your own health care? Is this a your community helps you get your health care? Um, is this your state gets you health care? Or is it your federal government gets you health care? How do you get health care? There are some people who take the position that like all of this is just something you do. I don't take this to be true at all because like at very, very minimum, you have to accept that, like, families are dependent on each other. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We we are total critics of the libertarian position. Um, you are not an independent existing thing systems that really doesn't do need other people. And you use them and you need them. There are exactly. some things that don't work very well outside of systems. Um, and in some ways, I think 
I kind of wish that this breakdown that we've given here was able to be part of the bigger political discourse because I think it helps us to realize um, something that I believe is really fundamental, and that's that we're far more on the same page as a, as a human race than we're painted to be. We agree so much more than our political discourse would make it seem like we agree. Mm -hmm. um, if we start from the idea that we all want health care, yes. as you've pointed out, that's not, no one's going to disagree on this. We're all there. <laughs> we're, we're all there. We're all there. It's and, the same page. <laughs> and to try and paint it as, as any more divisive than that is silly. It, it's really, it's unnecessarily problematizing a system, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I wish that we could start from there and then say, Yes, because basically what we've described is the tension that exists in a moral sense between the Republican ideal and the Democratic ideal in the in the U.S. It's just that the Democrats generally lean more towards systems, large systems are a better way of solving problems, and the Republicans say, no, small systems are mm -hmm. a better way of solving problems in a really, really general sense. Yes. Um, there's a degree to which the systems that the Democrats push for also have small systems built into them sometimes. Yes. And there's a degree to which the small systems in, on the Republican side have large systems underneath them. Um, great example is healthcare because, yeah, the Republicans are, are pushing for a, a family basis for healthcare management. But then they also are a part of a system that is working with insurance which is a huge system. Exactly. So, exactly. Like, it's not, you have to look all the way through like the things that are interacting because some small systems are just deceptively small and they're actually really large systems. That's actually, I'm, I'm really glad you said that because I think I, I think I just misspoke there. It's not that just by and large, we can reduce it to Democrats equal big systems Republicans equal systems of care um, <laughs> because that's not true. It, they're both dealing with small and large systems and they're basically just presenting different balances mm -hmm. of how you could make that work. Yeah. Which I would like to note here that like the, the belief that your average citizen could parse through what systems are at play and which ones are working uh, versus not working is kind of wild and another problem yes. um, because there's a reason that there's a tendency to simplify this down into a big government versus small government. It's a stupid distinction. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's because it's complicated. It's crazy complicated because like take, for example, uh, most Republican small systems use capitalism as the medium for managing those systems. Capitalism is the largest system on the globe, <laughs> period. And it's a system that there's a lot of debate whether or not it works as a large system or whether it needs to be abandoned as a large system. And does a random citizen know all of the factors that go into that? No, they don't, um, unless they spend a lot of time. And even then, it's questionable whether or not any one person could make a, a, a valuable critique to such a large system. It's There's a lot of moving yeah. parts, but... Precisely. So I think what we're trying to suggest is a better way of going about this is that basically treating these ideals of liberalism versus conservatism in the United States is yes. a it's a it's a very false dichotomy because they're not actually presenting two like sides of a specific coin because they're both engaging in both sides of these systems and they're just drawing the line somewhere and then doing a kind of group think where everyone's just trying to back one particular way of doing things as a way of grabbing power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think what we're trying to suggest is that if we recognized that both sides recognize 
both sides of the <laughs> yeah. of the uh, attention. Getting a slice of both pies <laughs> either way. Yeah, yeah. Then the conversation should not be between conservatism and liberalism, mm-hmm. but instead should be a conversation of in with this specific problem, mm-hmm. like healthcare, for instance, yep. we look at a, a specific problem and then we make the best analysis that we can of how well it's working as a big system, mm-hmm. whether that needs to be expanded or whether that needs to be pushed down to make it so that uh, the abstraction is lessened and people are actually interacting are, more. are interacting more. Like we, we can make those science kinds of conversations mm-hmm. happen mm-hmm. and be helpful. Two things to note here. Number one, use of terminology is difficult in this conversation. And so there's a lot caught up in the use of the terms liberal and, and conservative in the United States specifically. Um, and these terms have different meanings for philosophy and politics and social politics and all. It's just it gets wild. So don't read too much into those. I think you get the general idea. <laughs> yeah, good, good point. Um, but this is uh, I also think that your solution here works really good for policy but you can also and this is something i i want people to try and experiment with it's something you can intuit very easily if you just put it in the right terms we do this all the time where you're in a situation and you feel like you know what i don't feel like people are being seen or i don't feel like i'm being seen or i don't feel like there's real connection here this feels sterile We've all been in that situation. What is the natural and what we would say the appropriate response to that situation? It would be to like scale down, to turn to the people around you and say, okay, wait, are you feeling this too? Or how are, how are we doing? <laughs> are things okay? Um, and, and literally turning to your neighbors because that's a smaller scale. And, and that will re, re, reintroduce some more humanity into this sterile system. That's how that works. In, in, on the flip side, you can do the exact opposite, where you're in a situation where you feel very, very, uh, there's a lot of human connection and relationships going on and that's strong. And then you notice there are more people that need this. So then you scale up to try and get it to more people. And you do that until it feels too sterile. <laughs> and then you scale down again. And that's how you hone it in. And you don't have to do this like big prediction with numbers and efficiency and try and like calculate what the best option is you can just feel this out like you literally can in your own community look for the things that people need try and create systems that provide it for them and look at where the systems are failing and try and provide meaningful connection um to the people that are are being failed by systems it's it's a very simple calculus you can do yeah i one yeah i agree um, and it, it hurts that uh, one of the problems is that the more involved you become in your community, the less you feel like you're going to be able to be involved in the larger yeah. system. Um, and a lot of people who feel like the large system are is just failing in many respects, which I think it is in America. Yeah. We, we have a lot of problems on the large scale, and that's why our discourse is so often large scale discourse. Mm-hmm. Um, it, but it's also making communities suffer because so many people are being yes. so focused on the big picture yeah. that they're not being, they don't feel free. They don't even have the time or energy to, to become involved in their, in their community mm-hmm. at a small scale. And so it just kind of. Yes. If anything. The takeaway should be that the solution to big system problems are are small systems and and working with your small systems. And the solution to small systems failing people is big systems to make them more fair and equitable. Like that's that's how you do that balance. You don't see problems at a national level and try and fix them at a national level yeah. so much as you see problems at a big a big scale you look at the small scale scale and you use small scale things to eventually lead to big scale solutions like and and i think you can see this most dramatically in just like the concept of a vote <laughs> because this is you are a small scale scale system the smallest scale in society actually <laughs> and what is the largest scale system in our society <laughs> The government, you know, the federal government and you thinking that you 
by yourself with your vote are going to amend that system is just not going it doesn't do anything your vote doesn't actually matter on like that level but what does matter is the community on the smaller scale working together towards you know bigger changes so yeah i just think people have those backwards where they think the only way to solve federal problems are through you know federal uh, discussion and the only way to solve, solve small problems are on community level discussions when in reality these are supposed to be interplaying because there's this innate thing built up in systems and relationships mm -hmm. very, very well. cool very cool um this is a lot of fun for us and uh hope it's fun for you this is dope. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and uh, see you next week on Avocado Week. Mm -hmm.